we have a problem. You see, a firefighter's performance on the fire ground is based on two things, training and experience. And when it comes to saving one of our own, we're not as prepared as we think we are. Looking at data from the U.S. Fire Administration and NFPA annually, there's 486,000 structure fires across this country where 12 firefighters are losing their lives. So the percentage of time that a firefighter loses their life in a structure fire each year is far below 1% of the time, which means we do not have experience at rescuing firefighters. We have a problem. The problem is the only thing that we can rely on to save our brothers and our sisters is our training. And our training is setting us up to fail. Think about it. Every time you do a writ drill, you always get the firefighter. You're always successful in locating the firefighter where you evaluate for injuries, you transfer some air, you package them up and you drag them outside and then high five each other and sign the training roster. And we call that success. And we do it over and over and over again. Well, guess what? Every time we do this, we're basically cataloging that training into the subconscious, which says, this is how a firefighter rescue goes down. We're reinforcing that behavior along with that expectation. Every drill we do like this, we're filling up another data card for future recall. <clears throat> What's gonna happen when your department has a mayday? You're gonna perform just like you train. Your neurotransmitters are gonna be on rapid fire, accessing those data cards, replaying those videos of how this is supposed to go down. Your subconscious is gonna tell you, hey, go into that burning building, do a quick search, find your firefighter, evaluate for injuries, transfill some air, package them up and get them outside real quick so we can high five each other. Let's get real. Your rescue attempt is not gonna go down like that. Or at least we need to expect that it's not gonna be that easy. When a member of your department calls out a mayday on the radio in a voice that's likely to tie your stomach into knots, the stress level of everyone on that fire ground is gonna be emotionally and physiologically elevated. Rapid intervention is not gonna be as rapid as you expected it to be. Example, during this elevated stress, your crew is gonna experience communication problems, which is gonna diminish, diminish your efficiencies. And a large reason for this is because when the stress level of the crew members go up, the amount of talking is gonna go up, but the amount of listening is gonna go down. Auditory exclusion is one of the physiological effects of stress hormone-induced tachycardia, otherwise known as shit. <laughs> Have you incorporated this into your training? Elevated stress. Another example, company officers. They're gonna have additional and pretty unique challenges themselves. In the absence of strong fire ground leadership from that company officer, which needs to be developed back on the training ground under elevated stress conditions, Trying to keep your firefighters in check during an actual rescue is going to be like herding feral cats. They're going to be emotionally charged racehorses. And it's your job as a company officer starting back on that training ground to choreograph crew efficiency, crew integrity, okay, crew continuity, all while operating under elevated stress. Have you done this during your training? These are just a couple of examples where my training team witnessed and documented unexpected flaws and failures when we ran over 400 firefighters through realistic elevated stress rapid intervention training from 12 different departments. As a result of this training, every department made some changes somewhere. There were changes in the mindset and their approach to how they develop and deliver this kind of training. Changes in the equipment that they carried, changes in policies, procedures, processes, and many more. One of the examples or one of the scenarios that we developed, which we titled RIP for Real, started with a single engine company showing up to the training site. A training officer met them and said, engine one is inside this building fighting fire on this 200 pre foot pre-connect. You're RIP. Training officer says, treat this as if it was a real incident. Do your 360, gather up your tools, do everything you would normally do if given this assignment on any given fire ground. In fact, break what you need to break. Breach what you need to breach and access what you need to access. You think that swelled some guys up? Yeah, when was the last time you heard that during your training? So, they got ready. And then, the mayday call comes in from engine one, firefighter Johnson. There's a collapse inside of the structure. Johnson gets knocked off the hose line. His crew is able to get out safely. Johnson is trapped in that building. He's got low visibility, moderate heat, He's trapped in an area that he doesn't know what direction. He's running low on air. So the writ gets deployed. 
Jump on that hose line, head on in. Now the building that we were at was a 10,000 square foot warehouse that had office space in the front. It was a warehouse that we actually acquired for training. This was the last time a training officer interacted with them during the entire incident, right there during that briefing. So they enter in on the hose line, they have moderate heat, low visibility, they're following that hose line around, it ends up taking them out into the warehouse. Along the way, they've got some minor obstacles that they have to navigate, and that was just designed to suck some air out of their bottle, get the heart rate up, get the sweat going. As they get deeper into this building, the visibility gets lower and lower. We had five smoke machines going on inside of that building. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. About 120, 130 feet in the structure, following that hose line, they come up to this prop. I'll talk about the prop here real quick. This is something that we built inside the warehouse. This prop is 20 feet by 20 feet, 10 foot high stud walls, 24 inches on center, built 30 inches off the ground. The interior walls, two of them were lined with 7 16 OSB, the other two are inch and a quarter plywood. When they hit that prop, hose line goes up inside through a doorway. They didn't know that they had a prop in front of them. They couldn't see anything. We had ladders built on the corner so training officers can get up there with their tick from top and look down, observe. So the crew goes inside. And this is what they're met with once they go through the door. Inside this represents the collapse area or the debris field. We like to call it the trap room. Some of that stuff is bolted down tight. Some of it moved around. The hose snaked through there, up, over, around, under, until they got to the opposite corner where there's a four by four sheet of drywall and the hose goes through there. After that last crew member committed inside of that structure, that door was quietly closed behind them. Heavily fortified and reinforced door. That comes into play later. We also turned on the sound effects. We developed the sound effects that uh, we had a couple of pretty large speakers suspended above the prop and we had a huge subwoofer underneath the prop. Typical fire ground noises, right? Radio traffic, chainsaw, little air horn, uh, engine high idle, you know, glass breaking. There was different sounds that, you know, had different intervals. And it was starting to hamper communication in between the crew members and also on the radio. Stress level is slowly getting elevated as they're going through this training. First of all, just climbing through this kind of stuff isn't something that we do all that often, so it adds an element of stress. Plus, they're working their butts off. They're sweating. Now we've got noise. They've got difficult terrain to navigate through. Okay, the stress level is slowly going up. So they make their way through. They get over to this drywall. They breach through the drywall, and they end up in what we call the hallway. Right here in this hallway, they are actually going outside of the prop. They are exiting the prop, which they don't know, and they are now in between the prop wall and the exterior wall of the warehouse, about 34 inches wide. We built the floor to be uneven, so it was uncomfortable as they were going down. Some of the sound effects that are going off by now actually vibrated that prop. So we're attacking a lot of their senses. Stress level is still slowly going up. Once they get to the end of that hallway, they drop down into the hole, 30 inches down to the concrete floor. That was the warehouse floor. They start going down underneath that prop. They encounter wires, typical wires. Field of wires is about six feet long. If they were to get through that field of wires, they open up and end, uh, end up in the open area of the prop, and the far end is Firefighter Johnson, which is just a rescue mannequin with a pack on and the alarm going off. This drill was never designed to get to Firefighter Johnson. Why? Because we always get the guy. Why do we train the same way? There was one crew that actually did get to Johnson. They died. They blew right through their air management plan. They were ringing by the time they got there. Okay, but it was never designed for that. So when the crews got down into the hole and they discovered that there was wires down there, this seemed to be kind of that turnaround point, air management wise, having to call command for another crew to come in and take over, right down in that area for pretty much every crew. Some of the crews attempted to navigate through the wires and then backed out. Some crews didn't even attempt it. So they all turned around right in this area, had a back up out of that hole, and most of the crews left their rip pack right there. And they justified that by saying, hey, the next rit coming in is going to be able to use that. So they head up, back up the hallway, after letting Incident Command know that they were heading out, needed another crew to come in. As they're starting to enter back into the prop, following that hose line, Incident Commander gets on the radio, calls for an abandonment of the building, secondary collapse. We're in an abandonment situation. What does that mean to us? Get out now, 
move with purpose, take only the tools that you need to facilitate an escape, drop everything else, right? So now they're in an abandonment situation trying to navigate through this stuff. Without, son, without sight, their, their ability to hear and communicate is, is a little bit difficult. They're stressing out. Nobody's freaking out, but the stress, stress level's just climbing up higher and higher. So they navigate their way through there and they get back to the area where the door is or was because we had closed it. We built that with the seam so tight you could barely feel the seam with your gloved hand. They're trapped. Mayday situation, right? Stress levels continuing to go up. Now most crews did a really good job of recognizing this and calling for a mayday right away. A number of crews delayed, sometimes up to two minutes. That's a lot of life off your back. There was a few crews that completely forgot, forgot to do it all together. Now, called for a mayday. Now what? Oh yeah, we get to break stuff. This is where they got to have a little fun. They're trying to navigate around to identify their surroundings. The first wall that they come across, which is gonna be where the door is, inch and quarter plywood. So they had their halligan, their ax, their sledgehammer, whatever they were carrying, they went to work. It only took one swing to realize they weren't getting through that. They're navigating around, trying to identify their surroundings. They find the 716th OSB. They go to work on that, making a little bit of headway, but they also quickly realize that they're sucking the air out of their bottle pretty darn fast just to tear some holes through that OSB. Some crews decided just to sit down, conserve their airway for the cavalry to show up. This is about the time that most crews were expecting training officers to interact. Turn the lights on, take your masks off, hey, let's talk about this. I mean, because what else are we going to do? No, oh, we didn't interact. They didn't know we were there. Then their bells start ringing. We still didn't say a word. Oh, crap, we're getting low in air. We need the rip pack. It's back in the hole. They had to go back through this crap, out into the hallway, down in the hole, get the rip pack, come back up, navigate through back to that door area where they think that their egress is going to be, start transfilling each other. They did this until the rip bottle went dry. We still didn't interact. Then their bells start ringing again. And they're ringing, and they're ringing. They're trying to figure out how to get out of there, or some crews are just sitting in place, conserving their air. Then the bells start ringing slower and slower and slower. Stress level's climbing. When the first mask sucked to a firefighter's face, that's when training officers opened up that door, acted as if they were engine three. Hey, come follow my voice. We're here to get you. You would not believe the transformation that had taken place during this 30 to 40 minute time frame. They were bailing out of that prop as if this was real and they were actually getting rescued, sometimes climbing over each other. It was an amazing thing to witness. I want you guys to imagine something. <clears throat> you're on duty, and you're finally getting to sit down to dinner with your crew, something with tater tots, right? Hell, anything with tater tots at the firehouse. So you're eating dinner with your crew, bell goes off, residential fire in your first due. Right on. It's getting to be dusk. As you approach the neighborhood, you see a glow from the next block over. Nice. You arrive to this medium-sized two-story house with flames showing from two windows, alpha side, floor two, with possible extension up into that overhead. Offensive strategy. The scene's unfolding. Units are still arriving. Now you've got command structure in place. Your crew is assigned fire attack floor two. You grab the hose line. You guys are masking up. You go up the stairs with the smoke and the heater intensifying. You got some rollover coming down the hallway at you. You do everything you're supposed to do as a kick-ass firefighter. You knock down that overhead, you cool the surrounding surfaces, you hit and move. You get down that hallway, you make the bedroom in the back where the fire's coming from, and as expected, you knock it out quickly. Okay, now it's time to get in there, do some overhaul, open up that window, hydraulically ventilate. So you start moving that hose line in. About three or four feet, the ceiling collapses down on top of you, a large section. Your crew members had to bail out to safety. One of them bailed out a nearby window where they were hanging there and had to get rescued by ground ladder. The other one, she bailed out down the stairs. You, you're trapped in a burning building, second floor, back bedroom with the weight of the rafters across your body. You have moderate heat, moderate visibility. You know the fire's under control because you took care of that, but you can still, still hear crackling in the hot spots and your air is starting to run low. After a brief denial phase, you quickly realize this is not a good situation. Starting to feel scared, thinking about your family. 
and you're wrestling with the thought of, could this be it? Is this really happening? So tell me, right now in this moment, in your May Day moment, is that writ that's standing outside there, your firefighters, are they well trained and prepared to get to you before you run out of air? Are you 100% confident, regardless of who that crew is, that they're going to get to you before you run out of air? Are they going to be operating as a well-oiled machine? Are, are they going to be making effective decisions under dynamic conditions and executing their mission under elevated stress as if they've been there before? Well, they haven't been there before, have they? We have a problem. Now you have a problem. Don't be that fire department. Don't be that crew. Don't be that firefighter. So let's address this problem. Train. Get training. Get training going. And I'm talking about RIT, Mayday, Firefighter Rescue. Get this stuff off the back burner and move it to the front and give it the time and the attention that it deserves. This stuff is such low frequency across the country, it naturally falls to the back quite often. Change up your mindset and your approach. Okay, just don't keep going this, down that same road and putting things in your subconscious that aren't going to be realistic on the fire ground when it really happens. Be creative. Creativity is important. It's difficult to produce realistic training, but it's not impossible. We've got to be creative. Build props. Small, medium, large, make them challenging. Make them tough. Now, it takes money to buy lumber packages and hardware. We know that. Budget's a concern for all of us. But that prop that you guys saw there, the big one, $2,500 lumber package at the time we built that, we spent nothing. I made a list of Home Depots and Lowe's and lumber yards and mills in our area, went out and got donations for everything. Lastly, get acquired structures to train in. Your next residential fire is going to be in a place, in a building that you're not familiar with. Why not train in those kinds of environments? Now, can it be difficult to get acquired structures? Yeah. Is it impossible? No. So no excuses. Okay, develop relationships with the building officials in your jurisdiction, with, with builders, with agents, whoever you need to, so that you can get notified when there's going to be property that's going to be demolished or remodeled. Maybe you can get under contract and do some training in there. Now, RIT, that's just an assignment. That's simply an assignment. When we hire people to come into the fire department, we don't hire RITs. We hire firefighters. What I'm trying to say is, be good at your job. Be a good firefighter. Be a good company officer. Be a good command officer. Hold each other accountable, accountable to train, train hard, and train often. Because being average is not good enough. In the words of Captain John Cahill, train like you fight and fight like you train. Thank you.